Um, we're going to start by having the panelists go down and introduce themselves, talk a little bit about their work and what it has to do with EU-US relations. So let's start with Sean. Well, good morning. I'm Sean Heather. I'm the Senior Vice President for International and Regulatory Affairs at the US Chamber. I also uh, cover antitrust and have been working for the last uh, 10 or 15 years on US-EU related matters, uh, going way back to the tech, if people can remember that, which was a bush merkel uh, initiated initiative, and then more recently the TTIP, and now the TTC. And I'm Jens Jeppesen. I represent Workday. Uh, I'm based in Brussels, uh, Belgium, and I look after Workday's uh, policy and corporate affairs activities in the European region. Um, it's a pleasure to be back in Washington. It's been more than two years, and uh, that's a long time for somebody who's been working on transatlantic issues for, for many years now. Uh, so thanks for the invitation. I appreciate it. Hey there, everyone. I'm Alex Greenstein. I'm director of the Privacy Shield program over at the Department of Commerce. Um, I got into this in through a little bit of a roundabout way. I uh, worked for 19 years at the State Department on uh, the most recently EU issues, and so ended up working on data privacy out in Brussels. Then I was director for the European Union over at the White House. And then I was uh, worked on the National Economic Council doing tech policy and then moved over to commerce and have been uh, working on this. And we've been working assiduously on our negotiation of an enhanced privacy shield framework to restore stability to transatlantic data flows. And I'm Alina Polyakova. I'm president and CEO of the Center for European Policy Analysis. Sorry, is there an echo on the mic? OK, we're good. Um, as an institution, we work a lot on transatlantic issues. Obviously, Russia and Ukraine has been dominating a lot of our work more recently, but in particular, have been working for many years trying to understand how authoritarian states like Russia, China, and others are uh, trying to use basically Western companies to uh, censor the kind of information that their uh, populations are able to see, something that we call uh, digital authoritarianism. And as part of that, how the transatlantic commu community should come together and respond. So a lot of issues around the TTC now, obviously uh, broader uh, questions about some legislative efforts in Brussels around the DMA and DSA and how that uh, hurts or helps uh, transatlantic decision-making unity and tech regulatory policy. Thanks. Thank you. Um, with that, let's start right at the top with what's going on with Privacy Shield. Um, I would love if Alex could, you know, give us a briefing of what's going on uh, with negotiations, what we can expect to see in the next couple months, and what some of the main sticking points are right now. Sure. Though. Thanks for having me. And this is definitely sort of a priority for the uh, Biden administration. It's something that is. Um, I mean, it really cuts to sort of the heart of sort of like the transatlantic sort of values and sort of the importance of sort of the uh, transatlantic economy to both the United States and the European Union and the role it plays in the broader transatlantic relationship. Um, so a little bit of a history lesson. I mean, we're dealing with the fallout from the Schrems II decision, which was regarding uh, data transfers from Europe to the United States using the standard contractual clauses. However, and that's one of the EU data transfer mechanisms that because the European Union has a presumption that data should not be able to transfer overseas unless there is um, equivalent laws in sort of the other country. That's under the General Data Protection Regulation, their um, data privacy law. And so the United States and Europe have negotiated a series of sort of agreements on this issue to enable transatlantic data transfers. Um, however, on Previous occasions, this has been struck down by the European Court of Justice regarding concerns about U.S. government surveillance and the um, availability of the limitations on that and also the availability of redress for uh, EU persons who are concerned that their data might have been inappropriately accessed. Um, we negotiated an agreement a few years ago called the Privacy Shield Framework. Um, that was struck down by the European court, and now we've negotiated, now we are in the process of negotiating an enhanced privacy shield that would address the concerns raised by the Court of Justice in the Schrems II case. Um, it's important to note that the, what we're negotiating is only about national security issues and government access to data. We're not sort of revisiting the commercial elements of the framework, which the court didn't have any issues with. And so it's important to note that this is something that is 
it needs to be dealt with sort of between governments because this is essentially about national security issues. And so what we're working to negotiate right now are uh, something that threads the needle between sort of what the European Court of Justice requires under sort of European human rights law and fundamental rights, and then also sort of what the is possible under sort of the U.S. Constitution, and then also sort of what is, I guess I would say, sort of advisable uh, given sort of the national security commitments the United States has and our uh, need to protect the United States and our allies. Um, and I think that sort of as we've seen recently, I mean, it's um, it's a dangerous world out there, and that sort of reinforces the need for um, robust um, national security access to data um, with sort of appropriate limitations for um, uh, protection of fundamental rights. And so that's sort of what we're focused on right now. This has definitely been a little bit of sort of a long haul, and we definitely recognize that there has been a lot of instability in data transfers and that companies are operating in an environment of uncertainty right now about whether or not it's permissible to transfer data. Um, and that's sort of why we and our partners in Europe are working uh, to try to conclude this negotiation as quickly as possible um, because we sort of recognize that it's having an impact on sort of both U.S. companies but also European companies who want to be able to use U.S. Um, services and also, to be honest, do business here and operate their um, operations and factories and things like that here in the United States. And can you give us any timelines? <sighs> It's a question I always get, and I can't really make any predictions, but um, we are definitely sort of, um, I think we're sort of in the home stretch, and I think that, like, you know, we hopefully um, will have good news soon, okay, but I can't make that? any promises. Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, let's move on to Sean for a little bit and talk about some of the impact on businesses this uncertainty has had. What are you hearing from the business community on what it's like to sort of wait on a new privacy shield and not be sure if your standard, standard contractual clauses will stand up and, um, you know, how you're sort of feeling in the meantime? And more broadly, can you speak to just the EU-US relationship as uh, the EU continues with new bills about data, AI, the DMA, and the DSA, and you know, how the U.S. and the EU can align when the EU is being so much more aggressive than the U.S. is. Well, there's a lot there. Obviously, <laughs> this is the uh, State of the Net uh, conference. You all know more so than maybe anybody else I speak to how important the flow of data across borders is. Uh, it is the lifeblood of the modern economy, and so it is natural for companies to want to find legal certainty in terms of being able to support uh, those data flows. What is important and what Ashley said is that while a lot of the attention is on privacy shield, uh, the court decision last July, a year ago last July, uh, said that privacy shield needed to be struck down, but they put a giant question mark next to standard contractual clauses. And standard contractual clauses are the workhorse of data flows. Privacy shield's important. It's symbolic. Uh, lots of small and medium-sized enterprises rely upon it. Uh, but when you look at the bulk of the data flowing between the United States and the EU, it flows underneath standard contractual clauses. And this giant question mark, I think, has chief uh, privacy officers and general counsels of major companies, both in Europe and the United States, kind of scratching their heads, saying, what does this mean? Uh, and effectively, for the last 18 plus months, uh, it has not meant that DPAs across Europe have brought judgments. We have not seen decisions coming down in validating standard contractual clauses. But we do see signs that there are cases that are in the system uh, and that those cases that are in the system are, in, 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 are increasingly on borrowed time. Uh, they are not uh, the kinds of decisions that the DPAs across Europe can continue to push off. They're going to be forced, I think, at some point this year to begin to make some determinations and decisions. And the question is, if standard contractual clauses are an invalid tool to transfer data between the United States and the EU, we have no legal mechanism by which to do so. So the pressure is really on, Alex. Uh, and uh, you, know, you and the Biden administration have made this a priority from day one. Uh, it was a seamless transition from the last administration to this. Uh, this is issue number one, as far as the chamber is concerned, in the US-EU relationship. If we can't solve for this, there's no reason to have cooperation in the TTC. The entire TTC agenda, when you look at the 10 working groups, 
all has components about data and the ability to move data at its heart. Uh, so this is job number one. I am optimistic. Uh, there are signs uh, for those who are watching this closely that uh, the EU understands the importance. I'm also optimistic that uh, sadly, because of the events of the last week or so, that there may be even a greater sense of concern and importance to ensure data flows between the United States and, and Europe. You would never want to say there's a silver lining uh, to an invasion. Uh, but I do think that this has put a renewed emphasis on the importance of transatlantic ties. Uh, so I, I am optimistic that we might see, and I'm not in the negotiating room, I'm not at the table, but I feel like we have a chance to see something maybe mid-spring, late spring, early summer. Uh, that would be the window in which I'm watching uh, right now. Um, switching gears, you said uh, the state of transatlantic relations. Um, most people think about the U.S. EU relationship and they talk about uh, the economic relationship. And, and, and when you do that, in most cases, people think about trade, uh, the U.S. trading partners. But the U.S. EU relationship is different. It's really a relationship based off investment. It's very unique. Uh, we have you know, trillions of dollars of U.S. investment in Europe. There are trillions of dollars of EU investment in the United States. There is no other economic relationship in the world that is built on investment first. It's because of that investment we trade with each other. I think it's still true today that uh, there is more U.S. investment in Ireland than there is U.S. investment in China. That shows you just how significant the relationship is. Why do I say that? Well, when we've seen past dialogues uh, between the U.S. and the EU, I think there has been kind of this sense of hope springing eternal, which I think is today's uh, title for the conference, uh, or at least this session of the conference. Uh, my view is this. Uh, the U.S. and the EU have been cohabitating but never got married. Uh, we have this deep relationship that we have come, become comfortable with each other. Uh, and when we tried under the TTIP to formalize that uh, through uh, an actual marriage, uh, folks didn't like that too much. So we're now back through the TTC uh, at a negotiating table. My concern about the way in which these negotiations are set up is almost every issue on the TTC agenda, Europe has decidedly put out its markers as to where it wants to go on AI, where it wants to go on competition policy, where it wants to go on data policy, and there's not much to negotiate. Uh, there may be conversations we can have on cooperation vis-a-vis -vis China, uh, on cybersecurity, some of the other agenda items, but on the core regulatory issues that are going to govern uh, data governance in the digital economy, Europe has decided the path they want to pursue and I don't think it is interested in listening to the United States or discussing where the United States has views. And unless Europe is willing to sit down and have conversations like that, I think the TTC is going to have a rocky agenda. We're, we're definitely going to get back to that. Um, but I want to make sure um, that Jens here could talk about what Privacy Shield means to companies like Workday, companies of similar sizes. And just the view from Brussels, um, why do you think, you know, uh, Brussels has such an intention to set these rules for the world and to take a leading role here and get these bills passed? And what does it ultimately mean for relations with the U.S. and whether they can lead together against authoritarian countries? How much time do I have? <laughs> a couple minutes. <laughs> kind of a broad question. The, um, but, but beginning with Privacy Shield and, and data flows, um, so, so Workday is a provider of uh, software applications for enterprises uh, across a whole range of different industries, from banking to automotive, uh, manufacturing, energy, et cetera, et cetera, pharmaceuticals. And um, so we have something like half of the, of the Fortune 500 amongst our customers. Uh, many of those companies are European headquarters. So we have more than 725 uh, EU headquartered companies that, that use our services. So these are world leading companies and they need, just like American companies do, to manage and optimize data flows across borders to run their uh, operations seamlessly uh, ac across the globe, really. So uh, w sometimes the you know the the the, uh, the issue has been has been framed as 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 really focused on social media companies and their use of data. This is really not the case. This this cuts across all industries, um, and it cuts across uh, large companies and small companies as well. It's important to note. Um, so. 
following the Schrems II decision in July 2020, we had uh, European organizations uh, putting out data uh, to uh, demonstrate the impact of uh, Schrems II and the uncertainty that that has created on European businesses. And it, it, it cuts across all sectors and it cuts across uh, all uh, sizes of companies. Uh, we see uh, small companies in particular uh, have been extremely reliant on, um, on, on the privacy shield. Uh, you know, they now have to use uh, standard contractual clauses. Uh, this is a very difficult process for a small company uh, to manage, and they require a lot of legal assistance uh, to be able to make this work. Um, so this is really issue number one for the uh, EU-US relationship at this point. Um, I think, like Sean, we're super excited about the, the, the TTC. Uh, we think there is a, an absolute need for Europe and the U.S. to work uh, productively uh, across all of these areas. Uh, I think this current geopolitical situation uh, that, that we have been living with for the past number of months uh, just emphasizes the importance of that. Um, it, it is really, really essential that Europe and, and, and the U.S. Uh, try to see eye to eye on as many of these issues as possible, understanding that there will be differences in, in how countries uh, legislate. Uh, EU countries choose, have to some extent, some different values that express themselves in different policy choices from the U.S. That's normal. But you do have to ensure that there's as much uh, cooperation and alignment as at all possible. To your question about why does Europe move ahead so aggressively with uh, uh, legislation and policy in this space, uh, taking, taking European politicians uh, at their own word, uh, they sometimes frame it this way. They say, in, the, in this global technology uh, industry that, that is, you know, technology services and products that are integrated not only in the way we work but in our private lives education healthcare etc cetera, etc cetera, that they choose a road where they take an, an, an uh, proactive approach to regulating rather than seeing uh, a more market led uh, development where you uh, where, where technologies evolve and get deployed and then you try to uh, deal with issues as they come up um, this is, a, I would say, a deliberate choice of European politicians that has uh, advantages and disadvantages, but that's, that's at a very high level how the situation. Thank you. And that brings us to Dr. Polyakova. Um, so happy to have you here today. So there seems to be a lot of agreement on this panel that having an EU-US relationship over data flows and um, anything on the internet, digital, um, is important uh, for the geopolitical sphere. As we've seen the past couple of days, the internet is very involved in what's going on right now. We have both Russia and Ukraine making demands of American internet companies to either invalidate accounts or to demonetize accounts. So is it, it do you, in your view, think it is important for the EU and U.S. to be aligned on all these issues to be able to deal with the greater geopolitical problem, or is there room for some divergence between the two countries? Well, thank you so much Our for your thank question, you. Ashley. And I love going last because I have an opportunity to respond to what everyone else has already said. And I actually just wanted to pick up on uh, where Jens left off on why we have seen a real divergence in the approach between certainly Brussels and, and Washington when it comes to the, the tech regulatory agenda more broadly. And I think. Uh, of course, Privacy Shield is very much at the center of it. I couldn't agree more that unless we have agreement on Privacy Shield, that what is the point of the TTC, really? Uh, because how are we going to make any forward momentum there if we don't have the basic agreements on data flows? Uh, and, of course, the TTC is set to meet sometime in May, uh, mid-May now in Paris, and it's been very unclear what the accomplishments have been and where the agenda is actually heading. Uh, that being said, you know, I think what I've noticed over the last several years working on these issues is just a very different lens for understanding uh, the geopolitics of technology in Brussels and Washington. And of course, in the European perspective, a lot of that focuses on individual data protection and privacy in the United States. The lens is much more about national security. 
And I think it's very difficult when I go to Brussels or other European countries uh, to make the point that this is about national security uh, and that we have to prioritize that. And I think what's happening today, certainly with the renewed Russian war in Ukraine, um, lends just much more credibility to that perspective um, than that we should, you know, number one priority while data protection, individual rights is, of course, deeply important, but not when it is uh, goes against our broader uh, transatlantic security. Uh, so that being said, you know, it's it's been very concerning to see uh, what has been a freight train of a regulatory agenda coming from Brussels. Uh, which, by the way, doesn't fully represent the views of the European member states themselves. There's actually quite a bit of divergence, uh, certainly for some Central Eastern European countries, the Baltic states, um, and elsewhere from what has become a very uh, French and German-driven agenda on the tech regulatory side. And so there's a tendency, I think, to see things like the DMA and the DSA and um, you know, the AI Act and all these things from things we see coming out from Brussels is representative of the European perspective. But in reality... Um, it's not necessarily. And so there are a lot of uh, smaller companies that aren't being classified as gatekeepers, medium-sized companies uh, in places uh, like Scandinavia that have a very uh, active tech market, uh, have some concerns that, you know, they don't want to uh, clamp down on U.S. companies just to be replaced by French companies. And so there's a lot of divergence in how uh, the European uh, laws that we're going to be uh, going to see enacted in, in the next several weeks here, most likely, um, are going to affect the European ability to compete. And I think the big question for Europe, and this goes back to what Jens was saying about why, um, why, why has Europe taken this uh, leadership role on the tech regulatory agenda, even though most of the companies we're really talking about are not European companies. Um, and I think the reason for that is because there's a real fear of being left behind. Um, obviously, uh, the U.S. still leads on technology innovation. China is actively and aggressively competing there. So what is really Europe's role? Um, and I think they, European policymakers have carved out regulation, sometimes, unfortunately, in the service of regulation versus in the service of innovation, um, as their leadership in the world, part of their leadership portfolio. And this is where I think Europe sees its ability to have impact in the world to, through norms, international standards, et cetera. But, of course, I, I agree that it's probably a little too early for that because these, some of these technologies are still very nascent. And I think... Now that we look, back, look at what's been happening in Russia, of course, and, and China is also part of this dynamic, but to zero in on Russia a little bit, you know, deeply concerning developments uh, about how the, the Russian government has been using and abusing uh, Western uh, tech platforms in the service of digital censorship, uh, in the service of digital authoritarianism. Just over the last several days, we've really seen a culmination of what actually has been a years-long effort by the Kremlin uh, to force companies to comply with increasingly draconian local laws, the so-called new landing law, as it's called, that is affecting basically all companies, uh, social media, broader tech companies, platforms that are operating in Russia, uh, and de facto making them much more vulnerable to things like detaining, arresting employees of these firms um, if they don't comply with these draconian laws. Um, they're demanding the takedown of content that is truthful content, uh, which, of course, companies you know, have been resisting for a long time. I think that's important to know. I'm paying a lot of fines. But, you know, at some point, I think they come to a question of, you know, do we want YouTube in Russia still? And, of course, YouTube, for example, has been the only reason why Russian opposition voices or independent voices have had any avenue for expression in a deeply uh, state-controlled environment? Or do these companies just pull out and basically cede this, the information environment completely to the authoritarian state? And I think it's a really difficult situation that uh, firms find themselves in. I think it uh, um, really should be the prerogative of the U.S. government um, and European leaders to stand up for democratic values of free expression and to support and push back on some of these uh, very aggressive authoritarian tactics that we see deployed. But I think right now, uh, companies are kind of left in the lurk a little bit to figure out for themselves. Yeah, absolutely. And it sort of brings me back to this idea that abroad, the Biden administration, similar to the Trump administration, they're in the position of defending their own tech companies uh, to foreign governments that wish to tax them or put regulations that seem to be focused just on the biggest U.S. companies. But at home, 
they want to regulate them themselves. Uh, maybe you could speak a little bit to this tension that the you know U.S. government seems to defend our companies abroad, but at home there's a pretty robust competition agenda going on and a desire to have more content moderation and more privacy. Not saying we've passed many laws, but there are many efforts. Can you speak to that tension? Sure. So, you know, I think there are three things you raised there. One is this kind of competition policy question, which is more akin to the DMA. You have a conversation there about uh, federal privacy law, and then you have a conversation about uh, content moderation, which for the most part in the U.S. is a debate about 230. in the competition lane, in the pure competition lane, I don't see the Biden administration fundamentally having a different position abroad from what they have at home. Uh, the administration has made it clear that they do not support the DMA as drafted. They've made it clear to the Europeans that there's a variety of things that need to change. Uh, and at home, uh, the domestic legislation that uh, is, I think, most furthest advanced in the Senate. Uh, the administration has not put out a statement of administrative support for that. Uh, and in fact, you see large amounts of folks on the Democrat side of the aisle who have deep concerns with the way in which that is drafted, which is very similar to the DMA. Where I think you have tension in the administration is what should regulation look like in this space? And there I don't know that they have an answer. They know what they don't like, but I'm not sure they know what they do like. Uh, So when they put their opposition out there to Europe on the DMA, when they had withheld their full support for what's happening here at home, I think that's entirely consistent. What one should do about platform regulation uh, is where I think the administration is still trying to figure out what makes sense, uh, what would look like good regulatory practices, how much of this should happen as a matter of antitrust law versus regulation. Uh, In the United States, we're trying to do it as an amendment to our antitrust laws. In Europe, they've decided not to amend their antitrust laws and do it as a matter of regulation. These kinds of questions, I think, are very much still unanswered with the Biden administration. When you move to the privacy space, obviously, as Alex said, the debate around the US-EU is not about whether or not we have adequate protections for privacy in the United States from a commercial standpoint. Uh, The Europeans accept it. Uh, But we in the business community don't want 50 state-based regulations. Uh, We want to see a federal privacy solution. The chamber is very much in favor of that. Uh, I think the administration is very much in favor of that. I think the details are oftentimes associated with how you construct uh, things like uh, private rights of action and what happens when it comes to, uh, to a violation. And all of that will take some time to sort out. But I think there is a common agenda there. Certainly, I think the Europeans would welcome a federal privacy law. There's lots of European investment, as I said, in the United States. They don't want to have 50 uh, state uh, privacy frameworks by which to to address. In the third area, which is this content moderation uh, kind of debate, this is the one where I think it's the toughest uh, to figure out what is uh, a a legislative or regulatory path forward. Uh, Obviously, you have uh, clear requirements under our Constitution for free speech. uh, But we also know that you can't yell fire in a crowded theater. Uh, And what is the online version of that? has yet to be figured out. Uh, And so whether that is figured out over time as a matter of common law in our courts or whether that's figured out by the United States Congress, uh, I think it's we're a long way from having that answer. But the urgency is clear. Uh, It's not only being sorted out uh, in Europe through their efforts with what they call their DSA, but I see dozens of countries around the world who are putting content moderation frameworks in place. Many of those are within authoritarian governments who are dictating terms. Uh, what is legal content versus illegal content when you look at these regimes is very unclear. Companies are left to try to decide for themselves how to interpret the law. And then the ways in which they must comply in many cases are completely unreasonable uh, and outright crazy. Uh, So uh, that space is the one that both from a policy standpoint as well as from uh, civil society and the business community is where I think there is the most um, room to figure out what the path forward is. Uh, but again, I, on, on, the, on the competition piece, I think the administration is, is clear on their opposition on, to both approaches. What they're not clear on is, is what the right approach should be. Does anybody else have anything to add? Yeah, if I could just chime in there specifically on the content piece, because I've been working on issues around you know, counter-disinformation efforts for 
too many years uh, <laughs> that I'd like to admit. Um, I think one of the things that um, we have to really pay close attention to is the precedent-setting nature, which I think was Sean was just alluding to. Um, some of the legislation that we see emerging that talking about online harms and not really defining what that means, talking about illegal content. Uh, basically, some of the European proposals have been copied and pasted by countries like Russia into their own law, and now the, that very same language is being used to repress and oppress independent voices, saying that this extremist content, that it's illegal com uh, content, that there's online harms in certain content, which is, of course, truthful content. So it's being used in the service of censorship and repression rather than what they're supposed to be used, like, used, used as. And I think this is where we also hit this real problem. Uh, we haven't talked about this yet, but around concepts like digital sovereignty as well. This is the same concept that the, the Beijing uses as well to talk about uh, their desire to control the online space. And this concept has also become pervasive in the European debate as well. Uh, and so I think that question is, you know, wh where, where do the values come in here? You know, and if the United States and Europe are divided on the tech agenda front, then we'll be divided on the values front. And I think we need to start really pushing our governments to not leave um, companies just out there fighting the large authoritarian states on their own. It's long overdue. Um, and, and frankly, I think the, the current situation is just so deeply disturbing <laughs> uh, that we, this hopefully, I think there's a silver lining, hopefully the unity we're seeing right now between uh, Europe and the United States and the response to Russia will be channeled into greater cooperation on, on this particular agenda as well. Did you have something to add, Alex? Yeah, I mean, I think that that is like, you know, a very good point. And also just like having observed sort of EU-US discussions, particularly on privacy, but also on tech policy more broadly. I mean, I think one of the things is that there can be a little bit of an excessive focus on sort of, I guess I would say sort of the instrumentalities of how to implement sort of policy and the differences that we have there. And that can sometimes obscure the sort of fundamental sameness of our values. And I think that's something that like, you know, really I think both sides could sort of like, you know, stand to work through is sort of looking more at how we implement sort of our policies in practice and how that reflects sort of our fundamental values. I mean, the example I'm thinking of here is in terms of um, privacy. Certainly, we have sort of different approaches to it. But from the United States standpoint, I mean, we argue that sort of it's not a question, it's not a decision between sort of privacy and security. You can have both of those things, but you just need to sort of have the right policies and approaches in place. And we're trying to dig into that. One of the things that sort of is, it gets less attention than Privacy Shield, but there are discussions now at the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development about what are the appropriate safeguards and limitations on government access to data. And really, this is bringing together practitioners from the national security communities in Europe and the United States, along with sort of people who are responsible for fundamental rights, and looking really deeply into sort of what are the best practices around sort of government surveillance. And we're finding there's a lot of commonalities there. And certainly, like, you know, we have different legal systems in Europe and the United States, but when it comes down to it, the values that underpin them are quite similar, and a lot you find a lot of best practices. And so I think that does give me some hope for this moving forward that we have sort of more in common than we uh, have different. And then also sort of the, certainly the current crisis, I think, does focus minds on that a little bit. Um, yeah, that's my two cents. Yeah, thanks, Alex. <clears throat> that, that makes a lot of sense. And uh, I recall uh, Ambassador Bill Kennard uh, saying in meetings uh, that... Uh, that with the EU and the US, it was sort of the, the narcissism of small differences. I think it's a, it's quite a, it's a pretty apt observation, uh, given that the, the policy issues that are being debated and, and the values that underpin them are so similar, uh, whilst the institutional setup and yeah. the, the political dynamics are different. And, uh, and, and, and you mentioned the, uh, the, the Franco-German... Um, uh, you know, the, the locomotive is back on track. The, the, the French-German uh, locomotive of European integration after Brexit. Um, you know, there's there's a big UK-shaped hole in the Union where there was this push or pull towards uh, open trade, uh, uh, restrained intervention in, in markets, and so on. And, and so we really see that now. 
um, the digital sovereignty uh, uh, concept that you mentioned. Uh, uh, President Macron uh, likes to talk about strategic autonomy. Uh, we currently have the French presidency of the of the Union, and this has been a an, an incredibly strong narrative uh, that that runs across all kinds of policy areas. One, just one quick example is uh, there, is, uh, there are cybersecurity standards being developed, which for, for, for the entire EU, uh, that's entirely sensible to have that uh, cybersecurity uh, uh, framework for cloud services across the EU to, to replace national standards. Brilliant idea. But what the French uh, have tried to do is to introduce uh, what they call sovereignty requirements. So, uh, so that certain parts of uh, uh, the cloud services market can only be serviced by European companies with maximum uh, percentage of foreign ownership, uh, with no involvement of non-EU staff, um, with strict data localization uh, requirements in place. and and. So we're seeing this political narrative now really being uh, reflected in, in different policies across uh, across the sphere, and, and in a way that is probably actively, actively harmful to what the cybersecurity framework seeks to uh, put in place. Because what you do not want is to have is to uh, have it such that European organisations, public sector organisations, or companies cannot use the best possible cybersecurity uh, technologies in, in the market. Um, so there's a lot of work for us to do on this. If you look at the way things are going, I mean, it seems though data sovereignty and this balkanization of the internet is happening all over the world in Russia, China, India, uh, US, Europe. I mean, how do we sort of come together and have a free and open internet again where every country doesn't have different rules and the internet doesn't look a little different depending on where you are. Is there a coming back to that or have we gone too far? I, I can start us off there if you, if you don't mind, Ashley. Um, you know, we, we don't have a free and open internet in, on the global level anymore. I mean, we just don't live in that reality. I mean, go to China, go to Russia, go to Myanmar, obviously. Um, so I think at this point we are in a position, unfortunately, having defend the free and open democratic online space. And this is exactly where, uh, you know, the squabbles over details are deeply, deeply uh, unproductive and go against the, the broader strategic agenda of making sure we're all in the same place um, because we have to defend that space. Uh, we have to defend the ability of people to have access uh, to truthful information, a variety of sources. Um, and companies big and small play a deep and huge role in that. And I think my concern about things like sovereignty conversations, especially around cloud services and, and other issues, um, are deeply concerning because it's just reinforcing the splinter net model in a different sector. And we have to really shift lenses because if we keep moving in this direction, we're just going to reinforce the authoritarian vision of the online world. And it's not the vision I think that many of us here share um, or that many individuals would like to be a part of, frankly. And so um, that's the big issue today, like whether we can move away from, you know, the EU wants to lead on regulation and you know we can put innovation on the back bench there, uh, where we are on competition policy, et cetera, et cetera. We do align on the bigger, broader principles. And I think we have to come back and compromise. And I think a lot of that compromise, I think, has to happen in Brussels because they have been so much further along on setting out their demands and their agenda. Um, and the U.S. has been lagging behind there um, and hasn't been as engaged on some of these issues until uh, the current administration. So there's a lot of work we have to do, but I don't want to, you know, raise the alarm bells too much. But, I mean, we're in a really bad place right now, and we have to move really, really quickly um, to ensure that what we still have, that we're going to have for future generations. Yep. Sure, go. So, uh, I'll just build off of what you were talking about. I think the uh, one area where we risk atomization or, or fragmentation uh, is, is artificial intelligence, where the EU has uh, moved forward with uh, legislation uh, last year, uh, a very 
broad and uh, ambitious piece of legislation. Um, it's, it's early stages yet. Uh, it, it has a number of very sensible components that I think uh, will find a, um, a receptive audience on the US side. Um, however, it is not clear that it will hit the right balance between uh, the dual objectives, which is which are to, to create a uh, an ecosystem of excellence and innovation, as well as an ecosystem of trust and and a, and a vibrant market for trustworthy uh, AI applications. Um, so I think talking about the, back to the TTC, uh, we uh, would very much encourage the, the the U.S. government to be as engaged as possible and as um, as forward leaning as possible in terms of, of dialogue with uh, EU policymakers in this space. Um, the, the, the regulation is, uh, sets, is going to set out sort of technical standards for compliance. I think the worst outcome would be if we have a set of standards coming out of Europe that are then not compatible with what uh, uh, NIST, for example, has been working on here, something that Workday has uh, really uh, supported. And so if we can use the TTC to facilitate uh, alignment and interoperability and in a sort of these two pieces docking together nicely, uh, I think that would, be the, that would be the best outcome for all of us. Yeah, no, I think you really put your finger on it. I mean, in terms of like the word that I always focus on is sort of interoperability. I mean, we don't have to have all the same laws and approaches sort of on the internet, but we do need to ensure that they sort of work nicely together and sort of that there are sort of ways to build bridges. I mean, that's essentially what Privacy Shield was about, was you had an EU law that sort of like, you know, functioned differently than sort of U.S. laws, but you had enough sort of U.S. law in that space that you could make sort of an argument that if you add some things to it, it is sort of essentially equivalent. And I think that's kind of the spirit that we're looking at, is sort of finding ways to work together. Um, and that's also that gets to the issue of trust. I mean, trusting that, yes, the other systems may look somewhat different, but since we operate on the same values that we can accept that they will probably get you to the right place. And I think if the question was where are we headed, I think uh, the answer is, is we are not, uh, we are in a state of fragmentation. The question is how much more fragmented will we become? If you listen to part of the last session uh, with Congressman Call, he talked about essentially decoupling with China uh, when it comes to technology, the importance of export controls, the importance of not allowing tech transfer for national security concerns. Uh, if Europe decides to take a maximalist approach in terms of divergence with the United States on DMA, on DSA, on AI, on the cloud, we haven't even talked about the Data Act, which just was put out last week, which is an entirely effort to say, look, we're going to redefine what the definition of data ownership means, uh, what it means for B2B business relationships for data. We're going to compel the sharing of data, uh, which is a property right fundamentally. Um, if Europe decides to go down a completely divergent path from the United States, we are talking about a decoupling between the United States and the EU on digital economy policy. Um, when I heard you lay out the cloud stuff, I said to myself, are we talking about France and Europe or are we talking about China? The idea that you're only going to have a certain amount of local content, you're going to only allow a certain amount of foreign direct ownership uh, into a space, these are the tools China has used that have caused the challenges we have today in the US-China trade relationship. And so to the degree to which Europe is headed down that same path, we will end up in a position of decoupling. And that's gonna be very difficult when you look at again where I started, our relationship has been built on investment. We have invested deeply in each other's markets. And that investment is something that American businesses are interested to continue to make additional investments in and European businesses are interested in making additional investments here in the United States. So uh, we need to figure out how to get around the table at the TTC and work on these issues. Uh, but we do have some serious challenges given where Europe has decided to set out its agenda and where we stand today to these conversations in the United States. And uh, since we have Dr. Polyakova here and there is so much going on with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, I just want to ask you, what has been sort of the most striking thing to you in the past week or so that you've seen online having to do with the social media companies, Russia, Ukraine, and uh, the attempts at censorship, and even just a lot of the misinformation we're seeing? Has anything been particularly shocking to you or different? 
Well, it depends where the relative starting point is for shock, right? Um, you know, I think we're in a much better place than we were, for example, in 2014 when and Russia uh, invaded Crimea and eastern Ukraine, where, uh, which is when I started working on disinformation issues, where the Russian uh, narratives were really propagating into Western media and they were being spread very widely on social media. And then we saw how our inability to really grasp the importance of that then, of course, came to us here in the United States in 2016 and, and then elsewhere. Um, I think I've seen how companies have actually learned a huge deal over the last eight years and have been quite active in removing content, fact-checking content. And this has really uh, been a thorn in the Kremlin's side. You know, one of the big conflicts that we've seen emerge the last week um, was over fact-checking. And uh, Meta's policy of fact-checking content, labeling content, right. um, the Russian government demanded that they stop doing this, or they're going to basically start limiting access to their platforms in Russia, and, and they have been doing that, and Meta only partially is complying with this. And again, I think companies have been trying to push back. Um, I think one interesting development has also been uh, the European Union now ba banning Russian state-sponsored uh, media outlets like RT, Sputnik, and others. And my understanding is that the companies are following uh, the, the EU now, I guess, suppose law on this. Um, and that's been a really positive development. But of course, I think the big question is, there are you know, companies like TikTok, where are they going to go? Platforms that um, you know, are operating in these authoritarian states, but are not necessarily as uh, concerned about issues around false misleading information. Um, you know, I think we have to ask ourselves, do we want you know, our children to be using you know, Facebook or Instagram or TikTok, right, um, when we're talking about uh, control of uh, false information. Um, so I think it's, it's been a much better situation. I think governments have, uh, especially the U.S. government, has been very effective on the broader information messaging side. Um, and I think certainly Ukrainians, certainly people in uh, Central Eastern Europe are much, much more aware of uh, disinformation and they're much more, have a much more critical lens on it. Um, to, be, to be fair, I think it's, or to be honest, I should say, um, it's been really depressing to watch as well how um, deeply uh, penetrating uh, the Russian state uh, propaganda has been Russian society, which again is why I go back to the point of, you know, we have to fight to maintain freedom of access of information in these authoritarian states while we can, because that window is closing. Um, and the majority of Russians, despite the very brave and courageous Russians have been protesting the war and getting arrested and thrown in and beat up and all these things over the last, se last several days, that's still a minority. And the reason for that is because most people are buying the, the state narrative. And why? Because they don't have access to other information. Um, they're watching state-sponsored media because that is the mainstream media um, and that is the dominant uh, information source for many Russians. And I think we see what that leads to, right? So, you know, it's, it's a better situation than companies have learned. Unfortunately, I don't think governments have learned as much because we still don't have, you know, just a basic regulatory framework that will give companies some guidance on what they should, should or should not be doing. I'm not talking about, you know, things we were talking about earlier, but just some basic guidance. And so now we have, you know, companies doing all kinds of different things as they have been for many, many years. And it's also creating um, a lot of loopholes. So, you know, Twitter may, may be able to remove something, but Facebook is not, and et cetera. It goes on like that. So that is really limiting our ability to counter disinformation and false narrative on, on the online space. But I do think things are better than they used to be. Yeah, I mean, just last night, Meta announced that they took down a coordinated and authentic activity attempt, but it reached far fewer people than it maybe even would have a couple years ago. No, nothing like what we saw in 2016 with the U.S. election. It, it was a much smaller impact. So a lot of what me and my colleagues have been seeing in the past couple of days is it's not so much these sophisticated online disinformation campaigns. It's just regular people going online and retweeting something that isn't from the current conflict or was a picture taken out of context or just something that was totally unrelated, but you got a bunch of people rallying in support of Ukraine to retweet it. And we see a lot of confusion there too. So the companies are in a tough position. You know, you, you'd like to see the support for Ukraine and all of the retweets and the interactions we're seeing, but even some of this positive content or pro-democracy content is not accurate. So there's a lot to unpack there. Um, did, I just want to make sure before we wrap up, if anybody had anything else to add broadly about Privacy Shield, they, anything, anything we missed? 
And you said a week, right? Huh. Yeah, no, <laughs> next week it's done. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Well, thank, no, thank you guys. You. Did, did, you, did you want anything? Well, I, I, I think it's just worth pointing out that uh, this is a very concrete concern, the privacy shield. Uh, but behind that sits this whole other dimension of, of EU-US uh, issues in the technology space. And looking at the geopolitical situation that we're in right now, uh, this ought to focus the minds in terms of, uh, in terms of forging uh, really productive cooperation uh, on this in the very short term and the, on the other issues uh, going forward. That, that should be something with the, to strive for. I yeah, know that's definitely our hope. And also I can say that sort of in these negotiations, I mean, we have really strong partners in sort of the European Commission. We work with them on these issues for a long time. And I can say definitely sort of over the years, we have developed sort of a shared language and they've developed a deeper understanding of sort of our approaches on surveillance policy. And yeah, there's definitely sort of a um, mutual understanding and a lot of uh, goodwill there. And I think that's only growing. And so I think that makes me optimistic. Well, on that optimistic note, we will wrap up today's panel. And um, thank you guys very much for joining us. Thanks. Thanks.